Yeah, hi, Shishma. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. I'm available here. Uh, yeah, sir. So you can start the session now. Hello. Okay. Yes, I will be starting now. Okay. Yeah. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mukesh Sharma, and uh, I am based out of Shanghai for the last seven years. I am responsible for Tech Mahindra's business in the Greater China and the Japan region. I am also the uh, president for the Indian Association in Shanghai. So this is my second time uh, taking the webinar for our IMB and the associated friends. Why I have chosen this topic of uh, opportunities for Indian companies and entrepreneurs in China? Nowadays, I'm sure that a lot of you would be hearing about the news about India and China in a positive way, or also maybe sometimes in a negative way. The reason I've taken is that I have been staying here for the last uh, seven years, and uh, I have got some opportunities to interact with several business leaders and a lot of uh, uh, officials in the China market through my business, which I do for Tech Mahindra. And second, I have been associated very deeply with the Civil Society of Indian Association in Shanghai for now last five years and uh, serving as the president. So I get a lot of opportunity to interact with government of India and government of Shanghai and a lot of non-governmental organizations to make sure that we have a great bridge between India and Chinese people. And the contact between India and China has been business to business, people to people, government to government, and also culture to culture. So as we all know that we share 4,000 kilometers of border and almost 5,000 years of history, so there's a lot of things we have in similar and a few dissimilarities. But the pity is that it always we end up talking about dissimilarities because that's the way media projects it. But there are a lot of ground zero reporting which happens, which probably may not reach to a lot of people. I remember in 2009 when I was going, doing my EPGP 2010 batch, one of our very dear professor, Professor Vedanathan, I still his words rings into my ears and maybe my other fellow colleagues that India and China are not emerging nations. They are re-emerging nations. In 1820, he showed us a data that India and China was accounting 50% of the GDP together. And now they're around 20 to 22%. And he made a prediction that maybe by 2050, we will be again coming to the same level which we were there around 200 years ago. So now in order to understand the opportunities which these two big nations have between each other, I have divided today's discussion into three categories. One is the China context and the mindset, and who are the companies, who are the people who are really moving and shaking the market, and what are the opportunities which could be existing for people like you, people like me, and many others. I would also like to acknowledge that all what I'm going to talk today is not just only my knowledge, but I've also learned a lot from our partners, Gaofeng Advisory, what I have learned while doing the work for Tech Mahindra in an association, a deep uh, thanks to Indian Consulate, which allow us to interact with, and we get a lot of information from them about the insights about China, Indian business groups. I also reached out to my other business group leaders who work in different industries, and what are their expectations, what are their experiences. So I'm trying to put all this together for the benefit of all of us. I assume that there would be a lot of entrepreneurs, some entrepreneurs, and some people who are employed in multinationals. Some people would be working with some multinationals, must be trying to finish their educations, or maybe the mid-up education, trying to look at China as a market in multiple dimensions. So I may not be able to answer all the questions probably to the way of slides and what I have put in, but I'm pretty sure I'm looking forward for the Q&A session where I would like to hear from your queries and some challenging questions. So moving on, what is the China context and the mindset which we talk about? 
See, China, like India, has a great history for the last 5,000 years, which we know, a problem which is documented. If we just try to understand the China context, China has a history of very large and ambitious projects in past. That's their culture. That's the way they actually drive their nation. That's the way they think. For example, the Great Wall of China, I'm sure that some of you would have been to China, would have seen this marvelous piece of design and the length and the breadth of this great architecture. The Great Grand Canal, which is the complete underground, close to 2,000 kilometer, world's biggest man-made in early 500 AD, and which diverted the whole water to the south, running from Tianjin, Beijing, from the north to the, almost to the eastern delta of near Shanghai. Yes, this must be very identical picture. Silk Road is still in the news nowadays. China is trying to rebuild, rebuild the ties around Silk Road. While politically we may not agree, but yes, in past they have created these kind of mechanisms to grow their trade. And it stretches a whopping 12,000 miles. While we know what Columbus did with his ship, but we don't know what Zheng He did with his wild ship. What I'm trying to drive the point is that China has a very big thinking mindset. Sometimes you wonder, I interact with a lot of business leaders and say, how China has made it so big? It's not only a recent history, but they in recent past, they have been trying to do a lot of big, big scale things. It's not only past. If you talk about the modern times, they are with ambitious projects with high speed and intensity. This is a picture of Shanghai around 20 years ago. And when I came to Shanghai in 2011, it was completely changed. So within a span of around 18 years, they completely rebuilt. I'm not, I have not put a picture of 2018 because there are more skyscrapers now. It's more than even New York. World's longest sea bridge in the modern times reduced the travel from Shanghai to Nimbo from 5 hours to 1.5 hours. The world's largest speed train network, connecting 18,000 kilometers and completed in 10 years, we are actually thinking to have a bullet train in India. The electric car revolution in China has taken the biggest momentum, and in our lifetime of next two to five years, we'll see it will be the biggest EV market of the world. A company funded by Tencent. with a brand name Neo, launched a car within less than 30 years. It is unimaginable by the standards of the biggies, the traditional big players who have been making cars for a century. are in the top 10 highly valued companies. And five years ago, seven, eight years ago, when I was also here, we just heard their names doing good things, but we never imagined they will be in the top 10. And now, probably in the next three years, if we get a chance to interact again, they would be probably even... Three important things about the Chinese customer, because I deal with them day in, day out, and some of you would have interacted in the past. The blue shows the Western mindset, the red shows the Chinese mindset. The China color is red. If you see the top left picture, you can be very direct with Western customers while doing business with them. But in China, you have to find out a non-direct way of reaching your conversation. On the right top side picture shows you may have linear relationships in West, one to one, one to two, one to three, but it's a web of relationships. If you want to do business with Chinese, whether companies or government, you have to have to map a lot of people, a lot of people. It is highly complex. The second picture from the left, in the middle one, you might have a very clear communication in the West, but the communication in China is surrounded with a lot of noise. You have to figure out what they want to say, what they mean. The middle right picture shows in West, the leader looks at the problem from the distance and executes and provides a leadership in a distant way. 
But here, it's very hands-on. It is a part of the problem there. The top, the bottom left, the blue picture shows that the Western mindset or traditional mindset would be to encounter the problem and pass through it, tread over the problem. But in China, you don't, you try to circumvent and take a side step and don't enc encounter it clearly. The right and bottom side picture shows a very clear one. In the West, the boss is one probably amongst the equal. It's like a team member. While he has to touch the problem with the hands, but there's a huge hierarchy. So you need to figure out that the person you're dealing to make business in China, if you have opportunities, you have to clearly demarcate the respect for the boss. Now, the few key cultural concepts which you might be appreciating, a word called Guangxi, which means the relationship is the paramount thing. Mianzi, face, you can't lose your face. Saving and giving face is a very, very important thing. Li, which means the art of being courteous and polite. Kachi, which means the behavior of the guest, it not only means to be considered and polite, but well-mannered. There are few lucky numbers, few numerologies, they go by, long history of 5,000 years. Your appearance when you do business with China has to be conservative, neutral colors. You cannot be very loud. Handshakes and nod like similar to Japanese is a big, big culture. I'm trying to set a flavor so that when we move on to, from the China context to the mover and shakers to the opportunities, you will be able to figure out what opportunities you might have for your own business in present times or in future. The future of China is always questioned by many people. Some say it's the coming collapse of China. Some say it's the greatest bubble. Some say it's the elusive quest. Some say it's the next superpower. Slow growth, maybe high inflation, the story is over. So a lot of diverse and contradictory views are there in the market. It's like a black box with both optimism and pessimism, which goes in hand in hand. While the optimist people say that, yes, there's a stable economic growth, there's a capable leadership, there is a continued demand for investment, financial systems are resilient, there are signs of positive political change, there's an emerging middle class for more consumerism, there's a greener and more efficient China to come, and it's on course to achieve its global economic power position. But on the other side, you have the pessimists who will say, oh, it is now slowing down. It's not as growing as 12 or 13 percent, it's a meager 6.5 percent. But let's remember, it's a 13 trillion dollar economy, it's creating and India in three to four years is mammoth. Some say the real estate bubble is going to bust. Banks may collapse, inflation is out of control, corruption, unemployment. So there are different views. And everyone looks at the view a different way. People sitting 10,000 kilometers away, 15,000 kilometers away in US, in India, in Europe, keep on making commentary while they don't know how to navigate from one station to another station in China. So there are different views. Now let us look at this important point. China has seen the last 30 years of humongous development with, his, with their three important leaders who have provided the leadership in the last 30 years. If you see, Jiang Zemin from Early 90s to 2000, keeping a low profile, allowing few to get rich. Development is the hard principle. Made in China, but then it moved into Hu Jintao. When I came in 2011, it was, he was just moving out. He was focusing on harmonious society, sustainable development. That was a period where China really grew very fast because of global and their internal reasons to provide a mass capacity to the whole world. Xi Jinping. Maybe a very known name now because he has been elected, re-elected for his lifetime now. He is driving a lot of new changes, striving for green development, open wider for the world to realize harmonious development, eradicating the poverty, consolidating the growth, and bringing forth China as a big superpower in technology and science. 
Moving on to the next important slide. So now what it sums to? It sums that in the last 30 years, China moved catastrophically to a very, very high numbers. And we all know that is the second largest economy in the world. Now this is an important slide for the 13th five year plan. I know some of you would be knowing it. 35th plan is focusing on four important categories. One is the mass entrepreneurship. And the beauty is this, that when the 13th five year plan came in 2016, 17 period, now this really is seeing the light of the day. That's the power of execution in China. A huge mass entrepreneurship funding has been done internally and externally. Internet Plus, to boost the transform. It's a, it's a very surprising thing that India developed its internet industry in early 2000, and now we're trying to say make in India, whereas China is doing the opposite. They did their manufacturing infrastructure in the early 2000, and now they're moving to the internet when their whole system is very robust. Made in China 2025 is again their big slogan because they have mass scale, they had some troubles with over, over capacity, but now they are rationalizing to profitability and moving to a high value chain. One belt, one road. While India is not a part of this initiative politically, but yes, they are driving it very hard and they are finding their supporters. So they are doing a short term transition and moving to a long term stable growth. In the short term transitions, they are transforming their economic model, they are handling their environmental problems, they are handling the corruption, they are handling the volatility of the stock markets and moving towards a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship and opening up more and more to the rest of the world. Now, where are the pocket of opportunities which are emerging and some can be pretty huge for the people who are on this seminar today? If you talk One is this with rising disposable income, huge. I have seen the last seven years myself, while the inflation has got doubled, the cost of living has got doubled, but they have been managing it so beautifully. The whole economy is $13 trillion and, and rising. Construction infrastructure spending. So a lot of companies who are in India are looking to make some business or either to take the advantage of economies of scale, they have huge opportunities. One belt, one road we talked about, environmental crisis. In the period of Hu Jintao, they went on doing everything without taking care of what would have the effect on their environment. We hear about pollution in Shanghai, we hear about bad pollution in Beijing. It's all getting in control. They are seeing the blue sky now. Big health. We will talk about the future slides where we talk about how their young population is going to get older. They're talking a big opportunity in big health. So Indian companies who have got solutions for the hospitals, who have got solutions for the healthcare supply chain, pharma companies, huge opportunity. Industry 4.0, they made employment for their whole people available. Mass industries, mass scale manufacturing, but now they're moving to higher end of value chain. And Industry 4.0 is seeing a great, great investment. So Indian companies in IoT, Indian companies in the infrastructure factory, have huge opportunities to exchange. This is a very funny picture. If some of you can probably look at this slide, you can figure out the names of the nations. It is the nation's data which fits into the provinces. China works in a provincial way. Every province has a CEO, and his task and job is to increase the GDP of his or her own, or her own province. It's not like Arvind Kejriwal fighting in Delhi with someone else or a center versus state. So they have certain advantages of their communistic capitalism that they're able to create GDP equal to multiple nations, South Africa, Thailand, Malaysia, Colombia, Indonesia, all imbibed in them, they're huge. So what are the five overarching trends which are now shaping China's development? First, market reforms. They're reforming in financial sector, they're reforming in automotive sector, they're reforming in the IT, they're reforming their banking, they're reforming in retail, everything. New organization. Lot of middle class population is moving to little bit middle to higher class. Use consumerism. Environment sustainability we talked about. Shifting that demographics. 
their combination of age groups is changing and a new values emerging in the chinese they are very like they are very similar with indians they look different but they feel and look in their hearts they are same but their new values are emerging because they are real estate they become richer they earn three times more than an average indian their purchasing power parity is pretty high so new values are emerging in the society reforms will continue and will intensify there will be more deregulation we heard tesla announcing just two days ago opening their factory in shanghai it was never allowed for an oem to come and build of their own without entering into joint venture for example even mahindra group we had a joint venture we were forced to have a joint venture 10 years ago to make a tractor plant but now those restrictions are going on market forces are playing important role electric vehicles will be totally allowed without a joint venture they are allowing lot of entries into their sector because they realize that now they are not going at the same rate now look at the new urbanization which we were talking about the urbanization is is huge i don't have the data of india to compare with but it is pretty a huge data coming very close to japan you can imagine that japan is a country of equal to a population of uttar pradesh and china is 1.4 billion you can imagine the consumerism and the opportunities this market offers at east in china which is the shanghai and the eastern delta region accounts for a very heavy urbanized population a lot of opportunities in the retail and trading segment now this is a very important slide which shows that how china population distribution is changing and they are going to get little bit older and aging that's why they removed their one child policy and now they can have two two children so, so the government is able to drive these kind of policies and these kind of statements in a very very effective way moving on to the next one china's share of middle class among the china urban household significant increase the middle class is going to drive by 2025 the population of middle class will be around 650 million it's a humongous number the total expense will be constituting over 60% of total consumption 60% of chinese china's wealthiest people are in their tier 2 and tier 3 cities and we are just only focusing on our top 4 or 5 metro cities now look at the new emerging values of the uh, overarching trends we were talking about now these new emerging values are coming from multiple sections these are coming from their politicians these are coming from their grassroots they are coming from their elite people xi jinping talks about chinese dream li kaxiang talks about do the big thing one talks about the regimes and the french revolution publicly the grassroots level people talk about the toxic issues or the pollution so china is not is not as it was before it is changing the new values are emerging and the elite people are also talking the same language now the private sector which has played a great role in the china's development will keep on pushing it more le jun who built xiaomi i'm pretty sure xiaomi is in the hands of many indians top five smartphone maker till 2011 they were no no way at all rang jungfei which who built huawei into the largest telecom company huawei is everywhere they are winning everywhere they defeating anyone who comes in front of them li junzai who is the founder of lenovo they acquired the ibms laptops and now they are selling it every part of the world so more and more chinese enterprises have become world leaders dominating not only developing market but also western developed ones so there is a big advantage of partnering and working with these customers and these companies so not only only talking about the old or the big guys like huawei or lenovo or maybe alibaba but also china is number 2 in actually creating now the unicorns of the world this is an old data now they are number 2 they are all not only creating unicorns but they are also creating decacons 
a company called face plus plus has become a 10 a 20 billion dollar valued company run by a 27 year old person who does the recognition of face and anyone who is having a vivo mobile phone is giving their data of your face into a vivo mobile in india and the software is done by the face plus plus it's a 20 billion company just a 3 year old 3 year old company such is the power of the entrepreneurship and enablement in china now there is a forecast through some of the analysts that petroleum companies might become the world's largest oil company icbc or tencent might merge with city bank alibaba and amazon always talked about but what will happen in 2025 the world will see so they are betting big they are not only only chinese companies they are betting big for the markets all over the world but there are risks everything is not hunky and dory yes economy is old now it is little bit slowing down there are over capacities there is a pressure on the rmb the rmb keeps on fluctuating the state owned enterprise reform is not making much progress there is there are corruptions there are slow down in those areas commercial bank asset called they have lot of non performing assets the attractiveness of rmb denominated assets are decreasing so there are challenges but then there are all these opportunities because wherever there are challenges there are opportunities china's overall position in global economy will continue to rise their growth by 6.5% they will continue to grow by that and at this this is the choice of china which is they are making now they have the ability to grow by 9% as well but they are consolidating for a good growth for a profitable growth and in next 5 years they will be 20 trillion dollar economy surpassing probably even united states they are driving towards a moderately affluent society their values are changing the middle class is increasing innovation is getting more deep rooted number of patents they are releasing is very high so the opportunities are emerging amidst amidst all these kind of shadows so we talked about the china context i am sure that by this time you would have jotted down or would have some questions would have come to your mind you can send me so i give you china context would have given you a flavor some points would be known to you already some point would be new now let's move to who are the movers and shakers who are the guys who are winning who are the guys losing who have the future in this market see there are multinational companies who are here some have positive view some are waiting and watching some are already disappointed so companies like german automakers general motors ford etc they are positive they feel china is getting richer and richer they have this is the market some companies in cement steel solar panels they are wait and watch because they feel there is a lot of over capacity probably they will not be able to have a niche in the china market there are already a lot of companies like me uh, best buy media market metal they are all disappointed they had entered with the wrong strategies they already exited out i was meeting a professor of harvard mr tarun khanna recently and he said that now a lot of american companies are not thinking to even enter in china because they feel they cannot compete with the china is becoming so self reliant so it's a signal to the multinationals that it will be very hard for them to enter in china after 2020 a very important slide to see those who are getting it and those who are quite not getting it automotive yes bmw volkswagen audi premium car segments love german brands they get the psyche of the chinese customers highly profitable growing on the contrary a cura infinity lexus while very premium but somehow not able to get to the branding or the psyche of the chinese mindset kfc pizza hut starbucks get it very right I just saw an article of Starbucks CEO recently, just to be today in the morning. China was never a coffee drinking market, but tea loving country. How can Starbucks be the largest, largest coffee spinner in China? Even they have number of stores, the highest number of stores, even as compared to United States. On the contrary, McDonald's, though it's a great, great success everywhere, not able to figure it out. And there are many more examples. the sort of examples you can see a very important chart from our experiences in china there are product challenges who enter there are leaders there are market challenges and there are followers and there are these three important industries of automotive high tech and industrial has a great great distribution where you will see in the automotive 
companies like Conti, Kia, W, BMW, they are in a great position of leadership. But there are a lot of companies like Haimaz and Hafi who are followers. Higher GE, Airbus, great industrial leaders, but there are some companies like Philips lagging. A lot of high tech companies like Huawei and High Silicon and Samsung who are leading, but then there are some like TCL and HPs and Vistrons lagging. So it's a market which actually throws a lot of opportunities, but then there are a lot of players who figure out their positioning. Now, what it all says, what is the learning for us? This is an important thing for large companies, even for entrepreneurs who are thinking that China cannot be just a fringe strategy for you. It has to be the part of your core strategy, your core integral strategy. Example of, very, very simple example, the how the aspiring China market, everyone wants to be in China. They feel that China is the biggest market and why can't they do big things? A case example of a paint company. They have been in China for 10 years, with number two ranked, and their aspiration to, is to become three times, because that's the kind of opportunities China offers. But would they make it, would they not make it, depends upon how do they engage, how do they understand the context. Look at the exponential organizations. And believe me, these names were not even heard three years ago. Even I did not know these names. WeChat. One billion users now. It's the old data here. One billion users. Everyone is on WeChat. It has replaced email. It is replacing everything. It's a product. It's like a WhatsApp, you know. Everything happens in this. Xiaomi. Great revolution. DD. Shared writing. So these have become a great, great money spinners for China. And the way these companies have risen is astounding. Then there are some companies like General Motors, really figured out very well, came with a multi tiered product strategy catered to the multiple demands. There are companies like Caterpillar, which expanded in the early 90s, entering the premium category, but then shifting to mid range and low end. Human resource, great opportunity for Indian companies to partner and also to see how they can contribute. There are a lot of challenge, there are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of training companies in China providing great services to the Chinese companies. And it's a great opportunity for the Indian companies to really help China to develop the talent. We talked about the rapid urbanization. By 2020, the urban population will grow to 57%, and which will become the fastest wealth accumulation nation. So it's a great, great opportunity for increasingly urbanized world. So whether your fashion products, your jewelry, your retail, your garments, your lot of stuff which is also produced in China as well would be a considerable consumption for them. In the new mobility ecosystem, which we talked about, the DD, the shared riding, a new future mobility value chain is emerging where you can touch base the consumer with your lot of software and electronic offerings. There will be 5 million new electric vehicles by 2020. So companies in India who are into the value chain of electric vehicles have a great opportunity not to give to them, but to receive from them as well. Because China has, has taken a leap bound ahead any other car market in the world, and specifically against India. So a lot of companies who are trying to make electric vehicles in India can come to China and can get a lot of components to assemble, either as a completely knock down parts or even do joint ventures in, China, in India and fulfill Mr. Modi's made in India or make in India dreams as well. Now, after looking at the movers and shakers who have moved the markets, who are really figuring out, who are losing it, what could be the strategy, what is the China context, let us come to what are the opportunities which are existing for multiple people. I'm sure that I have put this slide specifically in two categories. One is opportunities in China for China, that you are in China and what you can do for China already. 
and there's another one that what you can do in India from China. In pharma, the imports, you can import a lot of raw material from India and you can do formulations and generics. A lot of the people who are doing this stuff here and China has an aging population. They really need a lot of support in the healthcare and they do not have sufficient capacity in some areas. So it's a big opportunity for the pharma companies. There's a recent movie just released last week. Uh, it's a Chinese movie where a Chinese person smuggles the cancer drugs from India and does a lot of good things to the people, which is illegal stuff, but a very beautifully made movie. And which shows that the population of China is huge, the concerns for health, aging populations are high. So pharma would definitely be a very big sector. Now, what in India from China, what people who are, let's say some of you are in India, want to set up a pharma company, trying to figure out what you can do. China is very, very high in their manufacturing excellence and process excellence in chemical industry and the pharma industry. So if you want to set up something in India, come to China, shake hands with a Chinese company, take all the process and implement it there. They're much, much ahead than India in those kind of technologies and efficiencies and productivity. Let's talk about the automotive and high-tech industry. There are a lot of people employed in the manufacturing segment. What they can do in China or China? China lacks a lot of software talent. The reason, China has a car market of 30 million cars produced every year. And they do not have enough software engineers, but, but India has software engineers. India has a huge turnout of software engineers coming out, but they don't have a great car market. So they have a lot of embedded engineers, but they're not giving enough employment. So it could be a great opportunity for companies who can fit into doing a lot of embedded software stuff for the Chinese companies. Autonomous car, this would be a big, big revolution which is coming and China will see it the first. So any companies who are involved or engaged in this kind of value chain would see a great opportunity. Now, in India from China, as I said, electric vehicle imports, they are much, much ahead in the electric vehicle. And there's no point of reinventing the wheel in India for doing the electric vehicle research. Come to China and partner with them. Get the partnership mindset and start executing. Now, let us see what are the opportunities for retailers and in trading. We talked about pharma, machines, the specific machines, a lot of machine makers in India who can export their specific machines, high precision machines in the Chinese market. Garments, yes, though they produce a lot here, but there is a specific demand for designed and high design products. What they can do in India from China? Well, People are doing a lot for many years and they can continue in the areas of mobiles, in the areas of high-tech products, in the areas of automobiles. What happens in ITO and the software industry, which I also belong to? Yes, China is moving on to a big shift in their pricing mechanism. The difference between India and China and the price is increasing much wider. So in the next three to five years, the opportunities will emerge where China will start outsourcing to Indian IT companies and and in the digital transformation roadmap. Now, what can happen in the areas of a segment which is called direct to consumers in China? This area, this segment has never been so much explored, but I know some of the business leaders in the China market, which are Indian leaders, are actually capturing this segment. Oyo is trying to enter with their direct e-commerce business model. Tetle with the Tata T is trying to enter and already entered with their products to the Chinese tea market. China is a tea loving nation. Incredible India, which is the tourism story, is getting a huge momentum. In 2015, when Mr. Modi was here, and fortunately I was in the audience and quite involved as a part of the Indian Association in organizing his visit, he gave a slogan to all of us that can each Indian living in China take five Chinese back to India for tourism from wherever they belong to. They may belong to Hyderabad, Chennai, Bangalore, Rajasthan, Nagpur, Delhi, Punjab, anywhere. And this is definitely a, a very big segment for the tourism. And there are a lot of individual operators 
tour operators and all who come and meet and the huge opportunities for them to cash on this yoga yoga is a new mantra which is happening they are finding it very very attractive they are finding it really really close and great opportunities for the medical tourism as well now very familiar picture of dangal now this has brought the indian film industry into the mainstream why in past amir khan has done a great by releasing his three idiots and i'm sure that my iron bangalore batchmates would be there or maybe some of them who have stayed in the campus three idiots were shot in iron bangalore campus in 2009 and coincidentally i was there at the time uh three days was released resonated a lot with the chinese population amir khan could figure out this uh, trick and now he's releasing secret superstar or this dangal and maybe many new specific movies are made hindi medium recently become very big success and the greatest thing is that india has only got 4 to 5000 and max 6000 screens for which a lot of people like ajay devgan and karan johar keep on fighting who will release their own film but in china you will be amazed to see there are 60000 screens in china that is why the indian bollywood industry is looking towards china but there is a catch catch is that because of the quota system between india and china government only two or three indian movies are allowed to be released but this situation can be changed with joint venture joint venture or co production houses coming up very soon so indian movies can be a big big great market because china has a great population great internet great means of touch points but they are seriously missing the content and i think indian entertainment industry can find a great place uh providing the content to the chinese market now what to do to achieve business aspirations one just to summarize we have to put the china business within a proper context the context that defines china as a core of the business the market knowledge has to be captured sensed what is going in the market the information exchange has to be highly effective and efficient building relationships has to be the most most paramount thing in china partnership this is the only mindset which can create a win win situation otherwise there are a lot of people with great capability has gone disappointed if the partnership mindset is not there then you cannot win the win the fifa world cup in china except and embrace diversity they are completely different looking and the way the language is the biggest barrier so you get accept that you can embrace the diversity china is also three times bigger than india in this size so they also have a huge diversity you have to tolerate some risk it cannot be completely de risk strategy no investment and gain and gain strategy you have to take some risk you have to be ready to lose some money and then you have to institution institutionalize your strategic anticipations communicate frequently effectively with your stakeholders in the market so this is what is the summary so now this was an image which was released by the ministry of external affairs to es bag or maybe you know maybe few months back which actually showed what india could lose with china by change it lose to gain and the reason i change it lose to gain is very pretty simple that why they can say that the cumulative investments of india is around less than a billion a quarter three fourth of three four quarter 700 million and china has 5 billion of investment in india we have a high trade deficit we have to lose out but it's not in last 45 minutes whatever we have discussed and talked about it offers a lot of opportunities in the film market in the entertainment industry pharma industry auto high tech exchange of machines exchange of people people to people business to business culture to culture so there's a lot of opportunities it can be done and whatever media projects are uh, maybe the flip side of india and china is not true because that is changing in a very dramatic fashion in last two months prime minister modi met xi jinping two times one in the beginning of uh, in the end of april in wuhan summit where was informal summit is the picture of the wuhan a uh, big national park there where they had an informal chat as typical modi saab's chai pe charcha and he had a great talk with xi jinping and then he again came in last month in early june for the security council meeting in qingdao 
So things are changing dramatically. Last week, I was with one of the ex-member of parliament, uh, Mr. Tarun Vijay, who was here, and we were describing and driving out some actionable items, how India and China can, can create a uh, more bridge which can be connected from people to people, seeing that we, we share 4,000 kilometers of border, we share 5,000 years of history, we share common dreams, and as Professor Vedanathan said in, around nine years ago to me in a class, to all of us, that we are re-emerging nations, not emerging nations. In 1820, we control 50% of GDP, and both of both the countries with this frequent dialogue and frequent exchanges, people to people connect, seeing it a more grounded view can actually create a lot of a lot of business for everyone. So the road ahead, from my perspective, after putting the lot of perspectives from different sources, is very positive, and we will have our own capabilities and own areas of. Uh, strengths and weakness, but I think a lot of similarities to talk about, a lot of complementarities to talk about and to go ahead. So with this, I take a pause, and I would be very interested to probably hear few questions which may come around and see if I can I can address because I don't know who belongs to which industry, but I'm sure I would be able to give a overall picture or flavor about the China context, movers and shakers, and the kind of opportunities that exist in this kind of market. So, Sushma, uh, this is all about a brief one, and I would uh, open it for the Q&A. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, all participants, you can post your questions to the in a chat window. Yeah. Mr. Mukesh will be able to answer your question. Yeah. So, Vivek uh, is asking, uh, okay, so, Sushma, I have to open the chat window. Uh, okay. Uh, so just hover your mouse on the top. Uh, okay. Drop down comes. Click on chat icon. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I can see. Uh, okay. Right. So oh, very good question by Vivek uh, Call. You know, which is asking that uh, talk more about the prospects of tourists from China coming to India. I think it's a very relevant question and very fresh in my mind because just uh, uh, four days back when I was with uh, uh, Mr. Tarun Vijay, who is the ambassador for the CII and the Indochina Parliamentary Committee, we were talking about that uh, four important things which are connecting India and China is films, food, yoga, and Buddhism. So there's a lot of uh, lot of Buddhism, Buddhist tourism is actually happening. While China media is controlled, you might not see a lot of news in the public, but yes, when uh, uh, when you actually connect with the people here, there's a huge chance for Buddhist uh, tourism there. So if you have real specific interest, I will be very happy to connect you to the uh, agencies or to the people who are actually working here. And our Indian consulate, uh, our, our consul general of India, Mr. Anil Rai, and also their team members are very, very helpful actually in, in providing those support. Okay, I get another question from uh, uh, from Shashi. He's saying that I am doing my aerospace MBA from I am Bangalore. Uh, what are the opportunities that exist for Indian professionals in China aerospace context? Oh, I think it's a very good question. I did not uh, put the aerospace market into this uh, slide, but just to give a perspective to you that uh, China is uh, is uh, testing their 919 the COMAC uh, commercial airlines, and uh, they are uh, are onto really you know good path, and uh, they have a huge uh, de demand and requirement to test their flights. A huge demand and requirement to put up a lot of aircraft health monitoring systems. So if you are very much interested, I think uh, working in the aerospace industry, especially in the uh, in the private air private companies like COMAC, would be very easy. There are other governmental organizations like EMIC, uh, which are the government bodies. While there are a lot of uh, Indian people have actually worked earlier, but in some cases, if there are some uh, sensitive projects or defense-related projects, then probably they may, may not give uh, opportunities in a very transparent way. But yes, China aerospace market uh, is, is shaping up very well because uh, after a few players like Bombardier or Airbus, they would be the only uh, nation to produce uh, aircrafts, and they will be making their own aircrafts definitely in the next five years. 
Uh, I go to the next question to Ashutosh. Uh, he says, quite interesting and useful information. Uh, he has two, three theories. What is the current situation of IP rights in China now, specifically enforcement of IP rights? I think Ashutosh, a very, very uh, important question you raised. I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, misconception about uh, China. Uh, there have been issues earlier where the IP were infringed probably in the regime of Hu Jintao, where, which I talked about in 2003 to 2012, where companies were outrightly copying the products and making it and infringing the IPs. But in 2012 onwards, when Xi Jinping has come, there's a lot of uh, efforts have been done and uh, the IP infringements have come to a real stop and you don't see uh, many visible examples in common day life which is actually coming into the light. There are some infringement uh, lawsuit cases still going on, but it has considerably improved. And uh, uh, the time has gone where they were actually looking to access the capability from other uh, markets. Now they are highly capable and highly resilient. A self-reliant uh, nation. So, uh, to be very frank, now you can actually uh, take IPs from them because uh, their IPs in medical, their IPs in auto market, their IPs in high tech is very good. So, I don't think so. They are looking for a very big uh, uh, access of technology or IPs uh, in many areas to other nations. So, picture has changed completely now. Okay, so next question is Malika Arjun. Uh, Thanks for the presentation. Would like to know how do how the agriculture and agriculture business sector in China would be impacted in India and vice versa. Yeah, I think it's a very good point uh, you raised. Agriculture and agribusiness sector, uh, it is definitely taking a big shape because uh, of the IoT and because of the new technology embracement which they have done. To just to cite a very simple example, in India we have been trying to force the use of Paytm and make digital India by you know banning the currency notes etc. But China actually adopted the digital revolution much faster in a very automatic way. For example, now we do not go out with our uh, uh, you know, purse or maybe on any kind of a wallet. We just go with a mobile phone because everything has come onto the mobile device and internet. And in agriculture, there are a lot of companies uh, who are actually doing good. And there's a huge opportunities in the China market. There are certain restrictions in certain products. And I know some of my friends in uh, China, who are Indians and uh, involved in uh, agriculture products, are working to import oranges, they are working to import uh, concentrates, they are working to import some of the Indian food products. So, I believe China has a big, big demand in the agriculture product side. If India can be certain in producing the quality and the quantity every year, then there is no stopping. Now, the reason I am saying, for example, I might say that I can give you 50 tons of oranges uh, this year. Now, China will give you the contract. But you yourself, by our supply chain in India, are not sure that you can produce 50 tons of uh, you know, oranges next year. And that's the biggest problem. We do not have a certainty in Indian agriculture system to make the produce in right quality and right quantity. And that's the biggest problem we have. That's why uh, China is trying to look at other markets like Philippines or Malaysia or Singapore or even Africa and so on. But India is missing this big point because we do not have uh, our agriculture supply chain with right quantity and certainty and, 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 and the quality. But yes, if you have some ideas and opportunities, I would be very happy to connect you to the Indian consulate who are doing a lot of initiatives in this sector. Okay, uh, what, okay next question is uh, again Ashutosh. What is in general health scenario in China? Which type of disease on the rise are heart issues one of them? Okay. I think it's a very uh, nice uh, question you have put because the demographics you see, the way people are getting older, but, but still if you see the life expectancy data, which I recall is something around improved from 79 to 81, which is putting a lot of health bill pressures on them. And uh, I personally worked with a lot of medical device companies in China from our tech minder perspective. So, I, I know that what kind of uh, health diseases they are they're getting. Uh, yes, there are heart diseases on, on rise. There are a lot of orthopedic diseases on the rise. The biggest challenge they're facing now is that the healthcare system in China and is still not uh, as mature as Western countries or like Japan or US or Australia. 
So a lot of diseases are getting unnoticed to for a very second or third stage. So that is the biggest problem that China is facing. That people are coming for the health checkup in their second or third stages, and at that point of time, their diagnosis, their uh, you know treatment, or the or the tools and uh, devices which are there existing are not able to take care of them. So uh, this sector is going to definitely grow, and uh, and you know uh, these diseases of heart definitely are growing because of uh, the changing lifestyle, and uh, certainly a big opportunity. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, healthcare uh, players. Okay, next question is: Do you think Chinese Data Regulation Act, similar to GDPR, poses a hindrance to free data transfer and business activities, especially in the field of e-commerce, IT, digital business? I think uh, Rohan Pawar, a very nice question put, Rohan. Uh, you know, we have been discussing, but so far, uh, GDPR. they are talking about it but china still is not posing any hindrance uh, the data uh, is still uh, exchange is still free in fact the face recognition or the data flow or acquiring data of the consumers for the analytics is quite free but the situation will and might change for example in the face recognition lot of companies who are uh, going very very fast here uh, china government is investing in them and now there are Uh, going to be restrictions and regulations in them, but it is not like uh, Europe where the GDPR and other uh, you know things are getting pushed. So for next three to five years, I think there is no restriction so far, and uh, that's why China is a great ground for experimentation, and that is the reason why a lot of entrepreneurs companies are mushrooming, mushrooming in a very very fast way in the China market. Ashutosh again asked one question: In which sector there is a potential for India to export to China, and also vice versa? Now that's a very vast question. You know, uh, what India can export? Agriculture, we talked about. That is definitely one area we can export. We talked about the films. Film export is a very good market where the content is definitely missing. Uh, pharma, you know, the uh, the pharma uh, raw material is definitely one which can be exported. And uh, earlier, steel and iron ore was a very good area of export. Solar panels export, and all these things were there, but now just declined. So, just to summarize, agriculture products, film content, uh, and you know, uh, pharma, uh, you know, chemicals. These are the kind of things people should look at to export to China. And what they can take from China, I think you can take a lot of things. You can you can just jot it down. You can take everything, you know, from China because they have a huge. Huge manufacturing uh, spread here, and uh, you can you know you can import anything from China. Uh, the only thing probably which you can focus to import from China is the electric vehicle segment now because they are highly mature. They have got a great supply chain. The electric batteries, in fact, a uh, lot of companies are setting up joint venture in India as well. So I would say uh, electric vehicle batteries would be a very great area where you know you should try to import uh, from uh, from the China market. Uh, other traditional trivial things of garments and uh, other stuffs of furniture and etc. All people are already doing it. Uh, mobile devices, your Vivos, Oppos, Xiaomi's, Mi's, and all already flooded the Indian market. Everyone has, uh, you know, that that thing. Uh, and then you have the big companies like Hiers and Huawei's who are already exploded, and you can import a lot of stuff from there. Okay, uh, Dinesh Chaturvedi is asking uh, the question. What is the? Uh, I'm just okay. Uh, so okay, he's asking prospects of setting up a brokerage firm for general insurance business. I'm not pretty sure if I'm able to understand the question clearly. General insurance business is like uh, is like uh, is insuring the business of uh, of individuals or probably for uh, people. For China, I think I may not be able to comment on this because I'm not able to understand the question. If you can reword it and send it again, a more specific, probably I'll try to answer. Uh, Vivek Call asks, under political reform, Ukan village experiment. Please clarify in more details. Okay, it's not Ukan; it's Wuhan. Wuhan is a western province of China. Uh, you know, around uh, two hour flight from Shanghai towards the west, and in Wuhan. uh they did this informal meet where when mr trump was putting his own combination pressures with india and china india and china have figured out that they need to collaborate more to actually create a good uh, 
a strategy for the Asia market, and that's why uh, Wuhan is a location name. It's a location province name where these leaders met after the Doklam crisis because Doklam crisis uh, was not a very good crisis which happened last year because the standoff of the military is uh, there, and after the Doklam there was no uh, formal and proper meeting which happened between the two leaders and Wuhan. Uh, was the location where they had an informal chat. That's why it's gaining a good momentum and very good uh, thing. Xi Jinping is is talking about Indian movies in all his speeches and everywhere. That's why Indian movies could be a very great soft bridge between India and China. Okay, Ant Kush is asking Hello Bukesh, please advise on opportunities in shipping and logistics between India and China. Especially for Indian procurement and spare parts, providing companies who want to expand to China, considering negative air surrounding one belt one road. Okay, see, you know, it depends. Uh, it's a very good question. It depends that what kind of uh, spare parts you want to export. Uh, there are opportunities, definitely. Uh, and uh, if you can be more specific, uh, you can connect me. You have my email ID. You can drop me an email, and I will I will connect you to the right people who can guide you in this area because it it depends that which kind of spare parts. Uh, which segment you are looking, you are trying to target. There are some uh, areas where China has developed a huge overcapacity, and they have they have, all, they have gone out of business in those areas, and they may not be building those capacities. So if there are complementarities on those spare parts, it's quite possible. But it depends upon what is the size of business you want to build on. If you want to build on a 10 crore or a 50 crore, 100 crore business, fine, you can build it in a year or a two years time. But if you want to build it a much bigger size of a business, then the whole strategy changes. And then it needs a different kind of a game plan. But yes, as an individual company, there are many, many companies that are operating in China. They have set up joint venture plans. They are producing. I met recently someone who is producing the uh, insulators in China, uh, producing insulators very near to Shanghai and exporting in any other part of the world. And they get a lot of raw materials from India uh, to actually uh, produce that. There could be a lot of uh, uh, you know things which can be done. Even of producing the spare parts in China. Okay, Rohan Pawar also. Uh, okay, I answered this question already. Shashi uh, says you want to connect with offline. Uh, my mail address. My mail address. Uh, I can uh, send it so that you know can write me uh, to. I generally I put in the end of the slide, but this time I did not. So you can drop me the message. I've sent it the email address into the uh, chat box. You can drop the message. Uh, Ashish Agrawal, any suggestions on how to go about partnering in China for IoT hardware and sites such as Sensors for IoT? Oh, there are many, many companies. You know, there are a lot of companies. Uh, it depends which kind of partnership you want to do. You want to bring your design and build to print here, or you already have got your hardware and you want to plug in with the, the gateways. And other solutions with them. So it depends what kind of partners you want to do. There are many companies and startups who have their own hardware as well. So uh, you just define the use case and and you can partner with them to produce a solution. Okay, Chen Singh asks, can you talk on the prospects of the quality of products, healthcare, to import from China as long-term business where it has been threatening for patient at times? So it has been challenging for G Healthcare to cope up with. So yes, I think there are a lot of uh, wearable devices and healthcare equipments made by a lot of Chinese companies. A lot of multinational companies were existing in China, but they are getting a big run for, run for their money. So a lot of Chinese companies have made very, very accurate and very powerful products, but it depends what kind of product you are looking for. And uh, if you want to really import for the Indian market, uh, then they need to be customized depending upon if they are plantables or they are not plantable devices or they are just externals or uh, if they are like vascular devices or they are orthopedics or or to the stains and heart side. So it depends on which kind of uh, products you are talking about. But yes, certainly a lot of opportunities. Okay, the next question is from Ravi Naya to is there a channel or opportunity from your end or the government where I can come to China and learn the business model opportunity and, the, and, and bring that product to business India and set up the business with the help of the Chinese partnership. The area that I'm interested in is real estate, manufacturing, and IT and could be combined as well. How could a new entrepreneur get help and is in to raise capital as well? My 
Oh yes, I think you know what I'll suggest is you go to the Indian Consulate uh, Shanghai website and write to the uh, the Consul General of India. Or uh, maybe you can write to me as well. I can I can connect to them, uh, and uh, you can make a visit to China. They keep on organizing a lot of uh, uh, business investment forums in China, uh, in Shanghai, and other parts of location where a lot of uh, people from India come uh, and join those forums and do a lot of matchmaking, find out partners, and and create business. Because if you have a order book, if you have a sales channel in India, then you can you can buy a lot of competitive stuff from the China market. And uh, whether it's a manufacturing, real estate, or any IT sector, you can get a lot of support from here. Thanks, Ashutosh. I'm glad you liked the uh, question. Sundar is. I'm just running, scrolling down. Sundar Arunbamang is asking. Are there opportunities for blockchain application market in China? Oh, Sundar, yes. I think blockchain is is booming a very very high in China, and I did not put that in this uh, slide. But I in my previous webinar when I was talking to all of you or some of you few months ago, I, I put about the artificial intelligence. Blockchain is is getting a big big momentum. I can tell you an example that peer to peer car sharing is is going to happen in China. It's already started in some of the uh, closed uh, groups. And uh, and peer-to-peer -peer car sharing is happening a lot in blockchain in manufacturing. So if you have got some application or some app already on the blockchain, I think uh, you know you can contact us also on offline because uh, TechMinter is also into the same kind of segment, and we keep on looking for very specific use case solutions built on this technology. So you can write to me as well. Muzaffar asks, "Will RMB merge as global currency? Is it stable enough to so that companies trade RMB directly?" Oh, well, it's a very tough question to answer because uh, uh, it is probably beyond my capability to make an analysis. But yes, there always have been debates about RMB losing uh, exchange, you know, value or maybe gaining ground. And it can it can emerge because ultimately now China is thirteen trillion dollar. If the next five years becomes a twenty trillion dollar economy, it will be hard to ignore RMB. And most of your global contracts and local contracts and uh, and your trading currency will become once it becomes the number one uh, economy in the size. You know why it cannot be because people will like to buy RMB and keep it with them because if it becomes a very robust economy and the largest economy in the world. Will companies like Google re-enter in China? Oh, that's a good question actually. You know, uh, I, I got a chance to meet uh, Google China's CEO Scott Bimot uh, just a couple of months back. He was in one of our events, and uh, you will be very amazed to see that Google already has 2,000 research and development engineers or consultants in Shanghai headquarters. So Google is already here doing a lot of research, collecting their own data, experimenting, experimenting in China, but they are not selling in China. They are not operating in China. So. They are here as a research or a delivery unit, but they are not here as a sales market. Uh, it might be possible, but then China will always have very, you know, uh, sensitive requirements about the data. And uh, whoever fulfills the data requirements or the confidentiality requirements, uh, still there is a possibility of re-entry. But it's a tough question to answer. Satish asked, "How long the U.S. trade war will last, and how much it might impact Chinese economy?" Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a tough question because the trade war is on. There are there are there are you no know, slashing the sanctions on either sides. But I think uh, what is being done is the is so fractional, which is just highlighted by media, that it is not going to make nothing no impact because. You know, uh, U.S. doesn't have their own supply chain. They are so much dependent upon China, and the kind of cost involved in manufacturing. However, they might be retransferring some of their plants, etc., in some segments. But as an overall 13 trillion dollar China and 2018, 19, 19 trillion dollar U.S., it's a 33 trillion dollar states, both states. They cannot uh, just survive on this trade war. So these are only just you know small firecrackers. Which are just only for political reasons. I think there is a business as usual. There could be a few things which might happen here and there, but a lot of companies are are working the same way, and uh, there will be not much an impact uh, considering the way the markets are transforming. 
Ashish Gawali asks, any suggestions how to go about partnering in China for importing IoT hardware such as sensor? Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, players here and uh, you can send me specific uh, questions and, you know, uh, I can help you to connect uh, to the people. You can, you know, uh, uh, import the IoT hardware. There are a lot of companies. Huawei is a one very known group. There are many, many other tier two, tier three level companies for routers, for IoT gateways for or many other kind of hardwares, clusters, highways. And so there are a lot of small players who are actually doing a lot of stuff here and they're already, you know, exporting it. So you can definitely uh, partner them if you have a good order book. Amit Agrawal, hello Mukesh, what are the opportunities for techno managerial roles in China? How much is acceptance and inclusiveness for non-Chinese managers? Oh, I think it's a very uh, nice question, Amit, you have asked. Uh, for example, I'm here for seven years while I'm working in an uh, Indian headquartered company. But uh, there are, because I'm also the president for the Indian Association in Shanghai. So I know there are 5,000 Indians in Shanghai itself. And then there are a similar amount of people in Guangzhou, uh, Shenzhen, and then, you know, few in Beijing. So we are around uh, 13 to 14,000 Indians in China. And uh, uh, I may not know about Beijing and Guangzhou, uh, but Shanghai is, is very suitable for techno managerial roles. And out of those 5,000 people population, a very huge number of people actually are in the similar techno managerial roles, working for Chinese companies, working for multinational companies, working for joint ventures. And the way China has improved in the last seven, eight years in the English language, the acceptability has increased a lot. However, face and language does matter in interiors, but in big cities, I think there's a very, very high acceptance. Thanks, Ashutosh. You like the answer. Uh, Sambit asks, what is the probability of getting a job in China after MBA for IM in India? I think it depends, you know, uh, it depends that uh, what kind of uh, roles you are looking. For example, I came to China uh, as an exchange program in, and had exchange through my EPGP program in 2009 in Tsinghua University, which is the number one university in China, which gave me a flavor. So I would be recommending our IM uh, faculties and, you know, our program creators that definitely keep China as in the exchange program because the biggest market and uh, and very close to India as a neighbor. So if people really want to do uh, and make their careers here, they have to definitely visit China and get an opportunity to study here. There are a lot of students who are studying in China, doing their medicals, doing their MBAs and exchange programs. I know a lot of IAM. Other IAMs are also doing exchange programs in China. I didn't hear after my batch, which came to Beijing, that they send anyone from IAM Bangalore to China. So I think a very good time for I am I am alumni organizations and faculties to probably uh, probably you know look at China again to make a part of their curriculum. In fact, next week I will be in Bangalore uh, participating in the IMBU conference, which will be organized in Taj Bangalore. I will be meeting some faculties. I myself will probably give them the suggestions if I happen to meet them. Very nice question. China, Ravi Naya, China also is not easy to get visa for work or business opportunity. How are you managing without expertise in Chinese language? We need to learn Chinese. Uh, well, you know, um, uh, things have been changing. Yes, you know, uh, I have been in this region for the last you now 15 years. I live in Japan, so I speak Japanese fluently and I speak a little bit Chinese. So in order to uh, get visa, you don't need to speak Chinese, by the way. But yes, you need to have some special skill. And uh, and probably you know some of the uh, uh, roles you are getting getting defined, and then only then you can get the work visa. There were issues in work visa. They will not allow work visa for very low end uh, skills, but for the special nation high end skills, there is no problems in the work visa. Amit Agarwal, hello Mukesh. What are the opportunities for tech? Okay, I already answered this question. Could you pass your email ID, Ravi Nair? Okay, Ravi, I already passed in the email ID. Uh, probably you can take my email ID, uh, you know, uh, you can write, it is Mukesh S228 at the rate of yahoo.com, which is my personal ID, you can drop me a message there. And, uh, okay, so I already gave my email ID. What about the quality of products from China? I can give you a simple example, uh, uh, Puduvalli, Deva Prasad Puduvalli asked this question to me. The quality of products in China, I can say, very simple example, that their cars, which have been produced by their uh, tier four car makers who don't have even a 1% market share, are highly competitive to anyone who is producing car in India. That's the kind of quality they have. 
and the kind of pricing and kind of scale it looks at, the the whole paradigm has shifted. They have also learned a lot. The efficiency in products have changed a lot. So believe me that their manufacturing quality is, is much better than many other parts of the world. And if you really compare with India, I think China is, is much, much ahead in producing the quality of the parts. Do you see opportunity, Kiran, for exporting a natural food product to China? Oh, yes, absolutely. A very big opportunity. As I said that, you know, food, yoga, films, and Buddhism from the Indian perspective is highly appreciated. So if you're able to brand and, and create a natural food product uh, which you can export, yes, there's a market, but it depends that what kind of scale you're looking. Are you looking for a multi-million dollar business? Are you looking for a million dollar business? So based on that, yes, there's a market and you can definitely make profits out of there. Malika Arjun asked my email ID. I already shared that. Okay, uh, so my email ID is already given by uh, IMB team as well. Okay, Vivek all asks, good discussion, opportunity for medical students to study medical. Oh, yes, Vivek, very nice question. You know, uh, uh, from the Indian Association, uh, I organize a lot of blood donations for the Chinese government to make some people-to-people -people bridges between uh, India and China. And there are a lot of medical students who come from Nimbo, from Zhejiang, from Suzhou, which are nearby provinces of Shanghai within two to four hours of bus drive. A lot of medical students, you will be amazed to see the number, around 2,500 students are studying medicine in China, uh, in the cities around Shanghai, and also in Shanghai, in Fudan University, I know a lot of my friends whose daughter and whose, whose son are actually studying medicine in Shanghai itself, and it's not expensive at all, and mostly those people are taking a medicine education who have some of their hospitals or maybe uh, you know, do, who have already some kind of nursing homes or something already going on. So they are just getting a degree in China, learn some skills, go back and make the practice there. So it's a very good ground for people who are already in this field and want to do medicine. No point of spending a huge amount of money in any other parts of Western world or even sometimes India. Very good facilities and, and very good facilities as well. I would be very happy to connect any one of you with the coordinators of the uh, medicine medical students group who are actually uh, studying in China. Okay, uh, Ravi Naya, do you hire for Tech Mahindra China location and any division under your division where they train candidates or utilize a future Chinese or Japanese business opportunity? Oh yes, you know, we keep on hiring, but to be very frank, uh, in Tech Mahindra, we have got 1,200 people in China now, and then 98% are Chinese. There are a few Indians and some Italians. So depending upon, you know, if there is some very specific skill, uh, you know, someone brings in, we are very open for that. Please send me, uh, you know, people who are interested uh, for any of the skills they want to offer for the China market. Antakush, uh, hello Mukesh, can we get the PDF copy of your slides? Uh, well, these are all copyrighted slides, you know, uh, I would uh, would not be able to share the presentation, but I'm pretty sure that you would have noted down some important points, and you can probably watch the recording. Right, so I think uh, with this, we had, uh, now I believe there's no more questions. We had a very good session. I learned a lot after listening to the wonderful, wonderful questions with all the participants uh, through to me. And uh, some, I hope I could be able to give some direction and answer. And if there's anything else, uh, I would be very happy to receive your personal queries on the email. Very happy to connect you to the Indian consulate, uh, med medical students or other sectors or anyone who, who want to actually uh, you know, uh, uh, do business with China, and there are huge opportunities which actually exist in uh, between these two countries. And uh, we should change the mindset, embrace the diversity, and the road ahead is quite beautiful because Prime Minister Modi and Xi Jinping share a good good rapport personally, and it is good for both the countries. So, with this, I think I'll close my session today. Uh, Great thanks to Sushma and the IMB team who are doing a great job on a Saturday in actually organizing these wonderful uh, sessions, which allows us to connect and also interact with all of you. So thank you, thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, for the IMB, I think it's a, it's, it's a paid seminar or some conference. You can go to the website and check with the uh, you know, uh, uh, IMB uh, community. Uh, I will definitely be there on 20th and 21st of July. It is in Taj, Bangalore. I would be really happy to meet any one of you if you are there. 
So I think Sushma, thank you very much. With this, probably over to you now. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir, for presenting the webinar. And uh, it's, uh, again, a big thanks. I think you are the second time you are presenting as a webinar. I don't know how many of you know it's a pro bono event, and it's been given by our alumni. I think big thanks to uh, Mukesh, sir. He is he is very kind enough to giving us a second webinar. Yeah. Uh, and sir, oh, oh, we'll meet. Oh, let's meet on the imbu. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Shishma. I look forward to meeting all of you. Yeah. And thank you so much, and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Same to you, sir. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah. And all participants, uh, thanks for joining the webinar. And there is one feedback form I had just sent. Uh, please fill it. Feel please fill the form. It really help us to you know uh, collect the feedback. You know. Yeah. Thank you.